Good evening. Hello. Oh, Dennis, Teray. Good evening. You doing? Mr. Mayo. Hey, how are you, Mr. Good. Sherman? Mr. Where are you Gale. on, uh, like in Utah somewhere? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Alta. Nice. We had a couple of lockdowns. We had so much snow that avalanche control forced us to stay in the building for a while. Oh. It's been insane. It's been, they've gotten over three feet of snow since I've been here. Nice. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Good for you. Good for you. Mr. Gill, is it warmer where you are? <clears throat> We can't hear you, Kevin. Yeah, there's Amy. Hi. Hi. Steve, can you hear me? I can hear you, Kevin. How's the feed? Is it working? It is working. Yeah, I got a message. Your bandwidth is low. Mine is? Kevin, Kevin's is low. All right, who do we got here? Me, we have Teray. Dennis. Hello, folks. Jeez, I found a day. All right, obviously, we'll give it another minute or two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Steve, I didn't get any late texts. You didn't hear from anybody, right? I did not. <clears throat> Still, Great. yeah. And let me just, let me check. No, nothing here. Yep, no worries. <laughs> Ed, Ed Bean gives us a quorum. Okay, yeah, Stefan just jumped in. 
All right, Steve, uh, I think it's about time to go. 701, we, we have a quorum. Thank you all for attending that are on. <clears throat> um, call the meeting to order and I will open it up for any public participation. <clears throat> Seeing none. Um, we have a series of minutes to go through. The first set of minutes is the uh, Finance Committee Town Hall Subcommittee meeting minutes from the 19th of January. We have a chance to look at those. I'll entertain a motion uh, from the, any member of that subcommittee. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Very good. Uh, Motion made by Don, seconded by Evan for January 19th, uh, Town Hall Subcommittee minutes. All those in favor? <clears throat> Anyone opposed? Thank you. IT Subcommittee meeting minutes. That was uh, Brian, Stefan, Evan. So that's uh, Jan uh, February 8th. Again, entertain a motion on those. I move approval in the minutes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Stefan, a second. I'm a second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, motion before you, the meeting minutes, uh, IT uh, subcommittee, February 8th, 2023. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could someone send me a, a copy of those minutes so I can post it? I did not get them. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll make sure you get that. It's no big deal. I'm not on the subcommittee, but we'll post yep. it all so that all our minutes are up to date on the website. So great. Let me just see. <coughs> David's on. Okay. Uh, next set of minutes is our meeting minutes, February 16th, 2023. Entertain a motion on those. So moved to approve the February 16th, 2023 com committee minutes. Thank you. Seconded by Dennis. Yes. Yeah. Any discussion on the minutes from Feb 16th, 2023? All those in favor of accepting the meeting minutes from the uh, Finance Subcommittee February 16th, 2023? Uh, Anyone opposed? Thank you. Last one was the fire department subcommittee meeting minutes. Uh, that would be Dennis and Amy. Uh, I believe we're on the committee. And uh, Evan, but he was absent. Motion on these minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Dennis, thank you. Second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any discussion on the meeting minutes for the fire department subcommittee February 23? All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Excellent. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. We have um, a number of budgets to go through. The first budget. Uh, Steve, anything else you wanted to try to cover before we get to the budgets? No, I, I just would say that uh, maybe after you do the fire budget, um, we do the uh, skip around and do the uh, health and human services because there are a few people on for that one. and. We can, you know, Kevin and I have to stay here, but not everybody else. Does. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, then we have insurance. Uh, I saw John on for the insurance. Yep. Yeah, but John can stay. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so um, for the fire department, does anybody from the subcommittee want to make any additional comments other than what was described in the minutes? Uh, I thought we had a very good meeting with the. Uh... Provisional chief, so called. Uh, he acted more like a permanent chief. Uh, no, was very familiar with the budget. 
it seems that uh, without uh, the uh, contract being settled, we really don't see the full impact of uh, what the fire department budget is. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the big change would be the uh, overtime being adjusted to uh, to take care of the averages, it's taking out the, the high year uh, seems to be in line with uh, the averages for the before the five years, uh, exclusive of what it, any raises may be. So I think it's worth the shot of saying with that fifty thousand dollar increase. Uh, he didn't see any uh, potential, uh, you know, retirement study that they are, know of as of this date, but it can happen at any time, obviously. Uh, and uh, you know, we, he, he was very familiar with the budget, and I appreciate his, his candor with us and, uh, you know, mentioning that if the workload is getting so high with the expansion of the town with all these developments going, that it may be necessary to, to eventually put a third fire station in the Montrose area because of the, the major developments going down for travel time to get to uh, Pleasure Island area. So that would be an increase of another 12 men. So uh, it's a major increase for 12 men in an engine, mm -hmm. plus a building. So. Uh, that's something to look forward to in the future. Other than that, I thought it was a very good budget. All right, very good. And um, I assume we'll have Kevin talk first or uh, Provisional uh, Chief uh, Tom, who's gonna go first? Probably Kevin, but Kevin, did we lose you a little bit? I see yeah, one. Uh, yeah, I bumped out and I'm, I'm back in. Okay, perfect. Uh, if, right, I, if, I could add, if I could add something, Mr. Chairman. Um, sure. I, I do agree with Dennis's comment. Uh, Provisional Chief uh, Purcell has been doing a, a, a great job and um, understands the whole budget process, has been very involved in uh, um, uh, negotiations as well. Uh, we had another negotiation meeting today. We hope to have that wrapped up um, before we go to town meeting. So now I just leave it for, I guess, Kevin to say a few words. Yes, I'll give a quick overview before uh, turning it over to Tom. Uh, the fire department budget, we're looking at an increase of $140,185 over the current fiscal year. Uh, the increase in personal services is $126,785. Uh, there are raises for the chief and deputy chief included here. Also step increases and in other contractual increases. Uh, there was an increase to the overtime line item for $50,000. Uh, as Dennis has said, the fire union contract is still under negotiations. Contractual services increased $9,400. Uh, there was an increase in telephone, $2,000. Uh, the auto repair increased $3,000. Radio repair increased $4,000. And advertising, $100. These are all due to increased costs. Uh, materials and supplies increased $4,000. The motor vehicle parts <laughs> increased $3,000 due to higher costs. The medical supply line item actually went down and decreased $3,000, where we are getting some state and federal aid uh, to help reduce uh, uh, that line item. Uh, and we increased the fuel line item $4,000 to the total, uh, due to higher costs. The total request for fiscal 24, uh, $6,467,517. Uh, I, I do wanna note that we will need a supplemental appropriation um, to cover the overtime uh, this coming year. Uh, we're, we're still working to see what that cost is gonna be, but there will be an article um, at town meeting for that. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Dennis, too. The subcommittee was excellent. It was a productive meeting. I appreciate it. Um, Kevin went right down the list. I'll open it right up to any questions that uh, 
the finance committee might have. If you could try to go in order, personal service, contractual materials and supplies and sundry, that would be great. Help me keep organized. I'm open to any questions. Great. Before I just take the questions, thank you, uh, Tom, Chief. Uh, we did get a, a PDF that you you have as well, a pretty thorough packet going over the accounts and, and, a, and a write up in support of all the accounts. Again, that's in that was in the uh, in the link. So, uh, uh, Ed, you have your hand up. <clears throat> sure, uh, Chief. Um, what's driving the overtime? Is it um, injuries, vacations, um, minimum manning, or is it all all of the above? Yeah, honestly, I think it's the same um, as it is every year. I know it looks like a big number, and it is a big number. But you know, we're not quite at at, at fifty five. You know, we still have two in the academy. I currently have three more out, long-term injury, at least two months. Um, so right now I'm running negative five. Um, mm -hmm. It always seems to be the case that we're always down in some way, shape, or form. You know, uh, there's military leave. Uh, there's retirements. Again, the long-term injuries um, and what have you. Um, one other thing that's that people forget that we've had quite a bit of is the FMLA. Now that might show up, you know, in long-term injuries, but we've got a young department. Quite a few of them are having children. And what I'm finding over the last several years is, you know, they're taking this FMLA to help their uh, significant other to rear the children for short periods of time. Um, that's bringing us down as well, too. Yeah, the FMLA is a is a big problem um, as the, as the workforce gets younger. Uh, I'm seeing this in our own fire department, so we're only in the police department. Yeah, well, that's Thank um. I and there is a minimum Manning, right, Tom? <laughs> yeah, the minimum Manning again. It was increased, so obviously, um, we're grateful for that. I mean, we really are. It's made a huge difference. Um, you know, it was twelve, ten was the minimum. It's up thirteen uh, max down to uh, 11 now. And, you know, as soon as we get three people out, we've got to start calling back. Um, mutual aid also, when we respond out of town to mutual aid, which we did, I want to say 52 times in 21 and maybe 64 times uh, last fiscal year. Um, you know, we've got to hire an engine company back to replace those three bodies when they go out. So, you know, that's another thing to take into consideration. Um, it's a four hour minimum. We bring them in if they're there for only four hours to keep the, the, the town staff fully staffed. Anybody else, uh, Don? Um, sorry, I was muted. Um, just a question on the uh, FMLA. Um, the municipalities are not part of the mass personal family medical leave, right? So the, the bonding leave and all of those things that were part of the mass um, legislation on that, does that apply? I am not 100% on that, Don. Can you repeat that, Don? What is good, Don? So the... The Massachusetts also has personal family medical leave. Okay, okay. And I thought last year when we discussed this, it, it was mentioned that the municipalities were not included in that, that, or was it just the funding of that that they weren't included in? Well, I mean, I, I think the issue is, is that if people go out on FMLA, we have to hire people back on overtime to cover it. So we are just FMLA as far as I Okay. Yeah, so I think the question, yeah. I think the question is really, so the state has FMLA that employers pay into it. Um, right. And then uh, mm -hmm. people can yeah. avail themselves and use some of that in, in the, uh, the state pays that. So I think that's part of the question. I don't know if Ed, if you wanted to jump in or not yeah. on the state. And, and the, 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 the municipalities could collect to do so. I certainly don't recommend yeah. it. <laughs> we don't, we did not. <laughs> yeah, all right, good. <laughs> But you're applying the uh, you're applying the federal FMLA standard. Then is that would that be true to say? Correct. Correct. I apologize. Okay. So some of the mass provisions in terms of bonding and those types of things, the the additional are, are not applicable to our folks. No. Okay. 
And the, and the FMLA, as, as folks involved with it, no, it can be taken in pieces and parts of holes. You know, it, it can be taken in two hour or four hour increments, uh, on notice in advance, but it's uh, bigger companies, it's a bigger challenge, that's for sure. At least that's my recollection. Evan. Uh, thanks, Chief. Uh, and it was a thorough budget document. It was really good. Um, you really didn't leave many questions unanswered yet. I still have one. Um, and I think it's a Kevin question, though. Um, uh, but but maybe you can answer it. So there's no COLA factored in here in the in the personal services line, right? Correct. Negotiations. Current negotiations. Uh, we met again today. A very productive meeting. Cool. I do want to say one thing, Evan, um, if you could excuse me. Uh, Chief Sullivan, this is his budget. He puts an awful lot of time into it. Uh, yep. I assist him, but this is Mike's budget and it is very well written. And he takes, he goes to great lengths to, to construct this, uh, to this budget and really explain it. Anyway, excuse me. Yeah, no, it's a bet. I mean, it's the best budget document we get every year. And I, and I try to say that every year, chief, it, it's, you know, um, it's, it's as thorough as it gets and it's really impressive. So um, the, the only thing is my only question then, and this just occurred to me now that we were talking about the overtime situation, which I understand in concept, but how do we calculate the overtime increase without knowing what the COLA is going to be? Cause right. Cause the, the COLA is going to, the base wage is going to affect your overtime expenses. Is this just sort of our best estimate? Yeah, it's um, going to affect everything. And you're correct. We're going with the five-year estimate. It's on page five, um, you know, it's 646, 521. Okay. It's basically a fifty thousand dollar increase, but it, it's an average. Um, yeah, it stays fairly similar with the increases. Um, the COLA is going to have to be factored in. The COLA changes everything it, from longevity to to EMT. To, I mean, this this budget there's increases everywhere, and it's different levels for almost you know every rank. Yeah, it gets a little bit confusing. Yeah. No, no, I I, I understand. You get a ten percent. I think I think it was ten percent somewhere around ten percent increase in call volume. I get it. Um, so, all right. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Dan. Yeah, um, good evening. So, I, if, if I understand what uh, Kevin had said, let's go back to a Kevin question, that we're going to have, we may have two articles at spring town meeting uh, for fire. One is uh, for fiscal year 23. And then if the settlement happens, it'll be fiscal year 24 in time. So Kevin, do you have a ballpark of what the fiscal year 23 article might look like in terms of dollars? For the overtime? Well, no, I mean, Kevin said, we're gonna have to cover something for 23. He did not say reserve fund transfer, which I thought maybe that would be the answer. Um, I'm just trying to get my hands on what's going on for fiscal year 23 that Kevin alluded to. Dan, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, if you look at the overtime, the current overtime, you know, it's running, you know, if you double the 440, you're up to 880,000. You know, we are going to need something. You know, I, I'm looking probably in the $200,000 range uh, right now, you know, and it could fluctuate if it runs higher or if it runs lower. Um, as we've done in the past, we, we we usually wait right until the end to figure out what the NEP is going to be and, and then protect it out as we get closer to the end of the year. Um, but, you know, best guess right now, probably a couple hundred thousand. Okay. And I can understand at, at that size, uh, a reserve fund transfer probably doesn't make any sense. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ed. Uh, just one more question. Um, so I noted from your narrative, Chief, that uh, we have a safer grants covering four firefighters, I guess. Correct. Hundred percent of salary. It's not a declining hundred, you know, seventy-five or fifty. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that. the possibility of expanding the force given the new construction and all the emergency calls and whatnot. Do you anticipate uh, applying for any future safer grants? Well, I can uh, answer that if we if we there's a new round coming up. That's why absolutely I absolutely will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a new round. There's a new round coming up soon. So I, I, I thought I'd 
Just ask we, did, we did just apply, you know, for some of the AFG grants for equipment, um, <coughs> you know, close to a couple of hundred grand, um, and not personnel, obviously, but, you know, as I said at the council meeting and the subcommittee me meeting, the growth is just unbelievable, and, and we're involved in it, you know, fire prevention and you know, myself, the chief, we're in these buildings constantly. We sit with these contractors. We're in the meetings with Steve and his his group. And um, there's just so much going on. Um, and there's an increase in simultaneous incidents. You know, so we're spread out all the time and we're going crazy. I estimate 7,000 runs by 2030. Wow. I sat with the Wilmington chief today for two and a half hours. He runs a BLS, basic life support unit, generates him about $1.8 million. Um, I'd be interested to sit down with him again to see if that would offset an increase in manpower. I mean, there are creative ways to do things. We need more people. We're going to. It's a fact. Uh, fuel's going to go up. Everything's It's going to have to increase. Uh, we're just we're, we're very busy. All right, does anybody else have any questions uh, for Chief Tom right now? All right, Chief, thanks for coming in. Uh, appreciate the time on both ends for the, for the subcommittee and our, our team. So thanks a bunch. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you to the entire FinCom and Mr. Mayo. Again, really, really grateful for all the support each and every year. Uh, um, that's very sincere and thank you. Chief Sullivan as well. Again, uh, he should be back very shortly. He's doing great. Uh, and this is his baby. Thank you again. And have a good night. Thanks. See you. Okay, we are going to move to uh, health and human services. I, I have the PowerPoint up. Uh, I don't know if the, that's you want that shown or you want to do it. Uh, is it Anthony or you want me to do it? What's your pleasure? Um, either way is fine. I also have it pulled up so I can also share a screen if necessary. All right. I, um, I'll run the button for you. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. Oh, where's the rest of them? I think, uh, I think Kevin's going first, though, for our budget. Okay. I'll give a quick, quick overview, Jim, and uh, then yep. turn it over to Anthony. Yep. Uh, the Health and Human Services budget uh, requested an increase of $6,116 over the current fiscal year. This breaks down as an increase in personal services, $12,984, which includes contractual and, and or negotiated increases. Uh, do want to note uh, health inspector's salary on page five of the budget. Um, it looks like there was a big increase from 23 to 24, uh, but this was not a full year salary for fiscal 23. Um, this position was hired, uh, it was either the end of September or, or October. Um, they are planning on using less ARPA funds in fiscal 24, uh, uh, $50,000 versus the 145,000 in fiscal 23 to offset salaries. Uh, and we are looking to use uh, $100,000 from the opioid settlement funds to help offset salaries also. Uh, under contractual services, there was a decrease of $6,594. Uh, the, the change there was under the professional services line item. Uh, now, uh, Storm has now entered into the agreement with um, and Melrose. So with the addition of Stoneham, we were able to reduce the cost there. Um, we also had small increases in materials and supplies, $141 in, in the mosquito control line item, $567. The total budget request for fiscal 24 is $389,892. Uh, and I do want to point out that we do collect revenue uh, from the Health and Human Services Department, approximately $50,000 a year. Uh, I'll turn it over. If there's any specific questions, if not, I'll turn it over to Anthony. 
All right, any initial questions uh, for Kevin on the budget itself? Okay. <clears throat> Anthony? Sounds good, thank you. Uh, first, I wanna say thank you to, uh, thank you to FinCom. Um, having us tonight. I want to say thank you to Kevin and Steve uh, for helping work through this budget with us. Uh, tonight we are joined by two Board of Health members as well, uh, Candace Linehan, our board chair, as well as Laurel Goreville. Um, so uh, after a presentation, uh, Candace will also be, will also be speaking uh, on a portion as well. Um, so I wanted to give everybody an update last year. I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for helping us get approved the full-time health inspector role. Uh, last year, we wanted to show that we were um, pretty far behind on our routine food inspections based on our FDA requirements. Um, this year, with the increased capacity of having a full-time health inspector uh, focused so almost solely on food inspections, uh, we've been able to complete 126 inspections as of, as of now since the end of fiscal year 22. Um, at this time last year, comparably, we only had completed 85. Um, so we are well on our way to completing the 285 routine inspections uh, that we are required to do. Uh, just as kind of a recap as to how we do that calculation, um, each, each food serving business has a designation of risk level. As you can see, there's four levels uh, there on the slide. Level one being your lowest risk, mostly convenience stores, places with prepackaged foods. Um, that does not make up the majority of our um, of our inspections, but as you go up in terms of risk level, we have catering businesses level two, most restaurants um, at level three and nursing homes and schools and other places taking a level four. And so um, as you go up in the risk level, that uh, that number of inspections per year required uh, goes up as well. And so when we, when we add all of our current permits together, we have 285 routine inspections to do uh, at a minimum every year. Um, the 285 inspections does not include our reinspections. As of this presentation, um, we've actually we've actually uh, had a couple more food reinspections. We're now up to 32 food reinspections completed. Um, so, you know, as part of our kind of food safety program here, when we do find you know issues in an establishment, our goal is to get back out there and uh, re-inspect and make sure that education is provided and make sure that the establishment is uh, up and running as soon as possible. Um, this year alone, we've had five, actually I think we have six, we've had six pre-operational inspections. Generally, these pre-operational inspections are for places uh, that are reopening after a long hiatus or brand new establishments. Uh, we've been seeing some nice growth in Wakefield in terms of businesses. So we're very happy to see new establishments come in and uh, the five pre-operational inspections reflect that. So now having this new position uh, based on the FDA standards, we're able to cover all of our required inspections and be able to complete the, the necessary food re-inspections. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of environmental health outside of food, we also have uh, complaints and violations um, falling under housing. And so as you can see right here, our housing complaints, uh, we've had uh, a slight uptick in housing cases uh, comparably of this time of the year versus last year. 38% um, of these housing complaints, 38% um, of our complaints were, of, uh, were in housing. And so something that uh, uh, Fire Chief referred to in the pre previous presentation uh, with uh, kind of new developments and further development in Wakefield, uh, we, we thought it would be uh, important to kind of highlight, you know, some of the work and where that falls within Wakefield. Um, based on the numbers, 70% of our housing complaints are in buildings with 10 or more units. Um, and 13% of these were kind of higher level complaints, uh, you know, mostly uh, complaints of a more difficult nature to resolve. So hoarding and fire, generally ones that require several follow-ups. And so, you know, as, as development increases in Wakefield, we want to make sure that we're tracking that and, you know, comparing it to what we have in terms of capacity to deal with them. Uh, in terms of housing complaints and environmental health complaints, for the most part, our senior environmental health specialist, uh, Aaron Carleo and I, uh, the two of us manage those complaints. Um, so we're able to kind of triage those across the three communities. Uh, we also, uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier, have now joined in a uh, regional agreement with Melrose and Stoneham. 
Um, so with three communities, we're able to kind of deal with all the housing, housing complaints as they go, and our inspector is able to be freed up to work on food predominantly. Uh, as you can see here, trash makes up 10% of our complaints. Uh, we also are continuing to work on education and enforcement in that category. And rodents, we've actually seen a slight decrease in rodent complaints um, for, our, for our fiscal year. And so um, we're working on kind of updating our rodent communication. We're fortunate enough to be part of a regional grant um, that includes six communities in our area. And we kind of share rodent communication materials, make sure we have translated materials, and we're able to um, kind of standardize the way we, we uh, approach rodents in the region because um, rodents are not you know, a Wakefield issue, it is a regional issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see here, uh, our, our permitting, uh, we are a revenue generating department. Uh, as of uh, last fiscal year, we generated 44,000 in permitting fees. Um, all of the permits you see here for the most part are pretty complex. Um, there are multiple steps for a lot of these, and some of these are seasonal permits. Uh, we have camps, uh, we have some pools that are seasonal, we have farmers market permits, but all of these require uh, quite a bit of work from our administrative staff each year. Um, I believe we're actually going to be shifting our uh, administrative uh, role for permitting to the uh, calendar year this year to match the common VIC process um, to make it easier for all of our businesses. Um, to kind of do a one-stop shop at the end of the year to make sure they get all of their licenses. Uh, but as you can see here, a lot of our a lot of our time goes into permitting, and we are doing a kind of evaluation of fees uh, for this year. And so we worked with the Board of Health to make sure we did a survey of the area and took into consideration, you know, historically how much work has been going into different types of permits and inspections to make sure our fees are reasonable. And so with some of the fee increases and some fees were changed, uh, we're anticipating about a $6,500 increase in revenues this year. Next slide, please. So um, kind of from the human services side of this, uh, we wanted to give an update on the community health trends. Uh, this year, we, uh, we continue to partner with Melrose Wakefield Hospital. Um, they're able to provide us information in the community health needs assessment. And so for this year, our top three causes of uh, these last two years, our top three causes of death in Wakefield have been heart disease, complications of dementia and lung cancer. And so we have programs within our department that tackle all three of these areas. And we work very closely with the COA, uh, with fire, with communication. We wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to help our residents, either through education or connecting to resources you know, to, to better care. And so some of the examples that we do, uh, we have tobacco and prevention and smoking cessation programs. Uh, we work very closely with the schools on that. Uh, our community education classes, uh, they collaborate with the COA and the Alzheimer's associations. We actually received a grant recently um, in Melrose. It's a kind of a regional effort um, to provide training for those uh, for dementia friendly and Alzheimer's association. Um, for in the bottom part, we have weekly blood pressure clinics, so we want to be able to en help engage our senior population in Wakefield as well. So our public health nurse, who I will be talking about later, um, is able to provide these services at the senior center. Some of our public health priorities for Wakefield um, that are identified by this assessment, uh, substance use concerns, uh, those are a, more than 5% higher on average uh, deaths per 100,000 compared to the rest of Massachusetts. And so that's still an area of concern for us. Um, we, are, we are working with our youth action team with the schools and the youth council. Um, they have been great in kind of spreading this information. And so we, continue, we wanna continue those programs. We had a lot of great success with uh, Drug Free Communities Grant. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a 10 year grant um, that we received. We are actually uh, coming to the end of that 10 year grant. And so all of those programs we have um, hidden in plain sight. Uh, we have many other kind of uh, parent university, other programs that we fund uh, through grants. And so we wanna continue that work moving forward. Uh, another area that we are concerned about is the SNAP gap. And so um, SNAP benefits for, uh, for low income uh, in, uh, families and individuals to access food. Uh, we're seeing uh, still a gap uh, between those who are eligible for SNAP and those who are not enrolled in Wakefield. And so one of our positions that we've put in is helping to tackle that as well. Um, and for cancer rates and social service needs, those, those, those concerns as well are things that we can tackle from our side uh, from an education standpoint and outreach. Next slide, please. 
So public health nursing, one of our newly added positions as of last fiscal year, um, we have a 0.5 FTE Wakefield public health nurse. Uh, this, this person reports to our senior public health nurse who is regional, but with the additional half-time public health nurse, we've been we've had great success with uh, keeping up with summer camp inspections. Uh, for those of you who don't know, when we have camps in Wakefield, um, our obligation is to each week check in with these camps, make sure that they have the correct ratios of counselors to students. We have to go through many, many forms to make sure their immunizations are uh, up to date. And so we go through many, many of these camps and campers every year. And so having um, this person on staff, we've been able to decrease the number of sampling that we do. So we're able to check more of them instead of sampling, uh, doing a sample each year. Uh, in terms of health promotion and disease prevention, having some having extra uh, extra hours from somebody to do this has been really useful. They track communicable diseases uh, within Wakefield. This year, as an example, we saw a slight uptick in tick-borne diseases, and we've been and we saw tick-borne diseases later into the season than we usually expect, and that's you know, due to a variety of uh, factors. But with you know with climate change and you know warmer weather, people were staying out longer going on hikes more often and so we then saw this trend of tick-borne illness kind of stretch into the you know later parts of the year and so it's important for us to be able to get that information out there reach the community that that, that interfaces with that and our public health nurse has been really good about doing research and, and, and engaging the community we also have our standard weekly blood uh, our clinics our, our flu clinics and covid clinics um, those have been a regional effort, so we've been able to offer many opportunities for folks to get their vaccines across all three communities. Uh, in Wakefield alone, we were able to uh, conduct, uh, we were able to get 1,300 uh, flu vaccines out there. Um, and it's been really good because with the additional hours of this public health nurse, um, we've been able to provide drop-in clinics at our, at our department next to town hall. And so we've been able to help employees get them at a more consistent level. Um, more conveniently and you know just during the day whoever's able to get here we're able to offer more opportunities to get the vaccines that ties into the homebound vaccinations as well as wellness visits uh, we've we've gone out and delivered vaccines to people who can't leave their homes and so that helps kind of get our numbers up there as well and last but not least um, the communicable disease portion every year we have an obligation to follow uh, reportable diseases and so this year, um, just for all of you to know, we have we did have uh, Ebola cases to follow, um, just close contacts. And so, you know, every year it's kind of hard to predict uh, what there is to follow each year. But you know, we we do have to make sure that we are able to cover that. And having this person has been very helpful. Our goals for next year um, with this new position is that we want to increase our health promotion, our kind of uh, our our uh, presence in the community. We want to increase our uh, opportunities for community education. We want to serve more, we want to provide more services for our ESL population as well as our homeless population. Uh, we're able to kind of uh, reevaluate some of our camp inspections and safety recommendations and be able to, now that we have more time, instead of just kind of maintaining the status quo, be able to reevaluate how effective our processes are. Um, so having this position has been very helpful. Next slide. And ESL is uh, English as a second language, is that right? Correct, yes. Yep. So another another large addition to our department uh, from last fiscal year was the social services branch. And so uh, our social service coordinator joined us in September. Um, since then, actually, he has now surpassed, uh, as the time of this presentation, has surpassed 100 households served. Um, so as, in terms of social services, you can see right here, there's two breakdowns. In terms of uh, initial service inquiry, um, the large kind of the large pieces of this are food insecurity assistance and energy and fuel assistance. Uh, and we also have a lot of housing assistance uh, requests as among other things. And so last year when we, when we first um, proposed this position, our, our idea was that there was food insecurity issues and that we wanted somebody to be able to connect people to the resources, help them fill out forms, help them you know, get in touch, troubleshoot these things. Um, and we were very pleased to see that our partnership with our Wakefield Food Pantry has gone so well. Um, our social service coordinator spends two days a week and a one night a week um, down at the food pantry. Um, he's basically a one-stop shop for all services that you might need. So people are able to fill out forms there, you know, receive the food that they need, but also schedule a meeting to come back with him and ask for other things. Later on in the presentation, we'll go through kind of a case study of kind of a, a typical case that we might run into. And people are able to kind of 
get access to services they did not know they, they had to before. Uh, the referral source um, for us was also very important. And so um, our Wakefield Food Pantry is a large portion of how people are able to reach our social service coordinator. Uh, Wakefield Gas and Light, I'll be going over kind of that program, the fuel assistance program later, but Wakefield Gas and Light has been able to utilize um, this position as well uh, to a great extent. And even internally, when we can make kind of referrals from our department, whether that's through inspections and we find folks that need assistance in other areas, we can help refer those as well. So, you know, we've been able to take advantage of having someone with that expertise who's worked in the social service field um, to, to help us with, uh, with our referrals. Uh, we're able to kind of break down also some of the demographics of the residents served. Uh, as you can see, you know, one of the things that we were pleased to see actually were the age ranges. And so you can see we were able to service a lot of the in between, you know, between the youth and senior age 25 to 40 group. Um, but also we we're able to serve kind of a 61 to 81 plus group. Um, and so that actually takes up quite a bit of our, uh, our percentage here. And so this is a great kind of example of our collaboration with the Council on Aging. Uh, we have folks here that are grandparents raising children. We have, you know, a lot of uniques in the situations. And so having this, uh, having the social service coordinator work with our existing social worker at the Council on Aging, we've been able to form a great partnership there. We also work very closely with the schools. And so um, when we're able to partner with the school, the schools are able to refer cases out to us. And so then we can kind of help follow up uh, outside the school uh, environment as well. We're also seeing uh, an increasing uh, diversity in primary language. And so one of the things we want to focus on uh, in the future is uh, health equity and health access. And so we want to make sure that everybody is able to kind of access our resources. We've taken steps in that direction. Uh, we've purchased uh, pocket talks, which are these devices that are able to help kind of uh, facilitate conversation a little more clearly. Um, but also we're contracting with Melrose Wakefield at times to uh, get um, to get uh, translators as well for these for these events as well. So just to kind of just to kind of run through some of the case studies that we have. So see, these are some you know general profiles of services received. So we have folks that are referred to us from you know St. Joseph's Church. We have Wakefield Food Pantry. We have public know schools. How to make sure I'm okay, so um, we have referral sources from three, three you know three kind of typical places. Um, and these are different demographics, but we have been able to connect people, you know, people will come in looking just for a mass health application or someone just coming in for a SNAP benefits inquiry or someone with no heat or broken furnace is kind of like their initial request. We've then been able to talk to them and see, you know, what are your other needs? What are other things that they struggle with? Things that they don't know they already have access to. Um, so, you know, examples could be Meals on Wheels. Uh, we've been able to purchase a new furnace through multiple different funding sources. We were able to secure rental income, um, help people connect to different behavioral health supports, heating assistance, DTA application, um, assist with uh, SNAP applications, enroll in food pantry, immigration support, um, connect to mass hire and fill out applications there and get winter clothing for children. You know, these are just some of the kind of ancillary uh, services that you know we are able to kind of figure out from a from a consultation standpoint, and these uh, these are helpful in terms of protective factors. Uh, we're able to get people services they need, um, and then you know before it reaches a crisis level. Next slide, please. So, just uh, for those of you who may have heard or have not heard, um, there is a fuel assistance program uh, we've been running, and so uh, thank you to town council, obviously, for approving the ARPA funds and. Uh, Steve and the administration for helping us push this forward. We collaborated with many departments within uh, within our town to make this a possibility. Uh, we basically are processing over 700 uh, with over 15 different heating oil delivery companies to process $750 payments for residents. And so this is in conjunction with state heating resources as well. So if they qualify for state funding uh, for heating assistance, then we're also able to help with that as well. Um, gas and light has actually been a, a very uh, pleasant uh, surprise in terms of how we've been able to work with them um, to kind of get their customers enrolled and the word out there. Um, we've actually reached a saturation level now where um, the community is so well, so well aware of our program that gas and light is able to 
reach out to their customers and other oil companies reach out to their company's customers and actually inform them of this program in Wakefield. So now more Wakefield residents are able to take advantage of this. Next slide, please. Um, and just uh, towards the end here, we're going to be talking about behavioral health and substance use. And so this has been uh, kind of a long-standing, uh, long-standing part of our department. Uh, our Assistant Human Services Director Catherine Dingra has been amazing at managing the DFC grant um, for for just ten years now. And so, you know, a lot of our a lot of our kind of achievements in these ten years, uh, we're hoping to carry forward uh, in you know in the schools and in the community. Uh, some of those are Wakefield Parent University. ESL Family Night. Uh, we've worked on a marijuana impaired driving um, initiative. We have Senior Night at the Wakefield High School. Uh, we had, you know, an example of something like the Molten Fitness Court that was put in uh, just this past year. And so we've been able to kind of bring all of these uh, ideas from the coalition and from the grant to fruition uh, over these over these years. And so our, our key partnerships that we formed are with police, the schools, with Elliott Services, the library, Wake, McMurrow's Wakefield uh, Hospital. You know, this list doesn't even encompass all the partnerships we've been able to form, but we've been able to develop all these partnerships, reach lots of different pockets of population within Wakefield. And I think, you know, this has helped us become more sustainable in the future. Um, I think a lot of it, a lot of success with this comes with kind of, uh, visibility in the community as well as trust that we've built with them and so I think future programs are going to are going to be able to, to uh, feed off the success and recognition of these uh, initiatives that we put forward. Next slide please. So this was the other position that was um, put in to the assistant director, um, Catherine Dingra. She was um, she has continues to direct the Wake Up Coalition, uh, which focuses on substance use and behavioral health. She manages the human services uh, and staff portion of the department. Um, many, many key collaborations run through Catherine with the schools and police, Council on Aging and Recreation. A lot of those are grant, are grant, uh, grant writing and grant management uh, opportunities. Uh, she also helps us a lot with evaluation and analysis. Uh, she also helps us develop, develop new programs for Wakefield, uh, the fuel assistance program being the most recent example of that. Uh, and she continues to serve as the Wakefield Youth Council advisor. And so, you know, we wanted to make sure that with all these programs, with all these uh, pieces uh, that we tried to we try to establish within the community, that we have great um, oversight of those. And so, Catherine's done a great job focusing on that area. And this is going to be the last slide. This is just a kind of a summary of all the grant initiatives and programs. And so, you know, inherently, the health department um, is very much tied to grant funding. And so we want to make sure that we are we are trying to be sustainable. We are trying to support a lot of our initiatives for the town in the most you know in the most fiscally financial uh, most financially uh, responsible way. And so these are just some of the examples of grants that we've received um, in in the near uh, in the recent past. And so we have Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, Community Health Index. You know a lot of this work that we're able to do regionally as well. Uh, as some of you may have heard, we actually received a one million dollar uh, stop school violence grant. Um, this past year. And so that was actually a Melrose uh, hosted grant that we wrote in conjunction with Wakefield and Stoneham. That $1 million goes towards funding three adjustment counselors, one for each school district for three years, fully funded. And so, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of our work is able to tie into the schools and other departments within town. And so hopefully we've been able to demonstrate that, you know, the more, the more we're able to kind of continue our, our grant initiatives and our uh, public health work, um, this can help benefit the town further. Thank you. Very good, Anthony, thank you. Um, I will open it up for questions to either Kevin or Anthony or others that are here. Uh, Evan. Hi, Anthony, I this is, um. this might be a little bit out of left field, um, which is not un uncharacteristic of me, but, um, I, uh, I'm just recalling from, from my days in Amesbury, we had a couple of lakes. We obviously have a couple of lakes in Wakefield. Our problem up there was um, cyanobacteria um, that yes. would sort of plume in the, or I think that was the word, um, in the summer. And there was regular testing. And I know we have some issues with contamination in, in Lake, in Lake Um 
in Amesbury, it was the it was the health department that did that testing. Do you guys do any of that? I'm just I'm just curious. I didn't I wasn't sure if I I saw it in um I saw it mentioned in the presentation. It, it was a thorough presentation, so I just wanted to yeah, I just wanted yeah. to inquire about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually work, uh, we're, we're starting to work closely with Friends of Lake Q. Uh, we're, we're starting to kind of build that relationship. We historically, and you know, Candace is here and as, as well as Laurel Goreville, historically, I think we've somehow been involved, but not in the recent past that we've done any, you know, regular testing. And so um, we, you know, we'll, we'll be looking into that. I believe uh, there's another project, I think it's funded by ARPA right now, um, that will be tackling runoff uh, into the lake. And so, yeah, Steve, yeah, Steve can verify for that as well. But um, yeah, so we'll be collaborating with different departments within within town to make sure that uh, you know we do any proper surveys we need to uh, to make sure that's safe. Cool. Thanks. I was just curious. I appreciate, it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, and I didn't mean to cut off, but um, Candace, uh, I, I realized I didn't get a chance to give, didn't get a chance to speak it. So I'll, I'll let Candace kind of finish off the presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to kind of echo a little bit of what Anthony said. And of course, thank you for having me here. Uh, and thanks, Anthony, for that wonderful, comprehensive presentation. I think, um, you know, it's important to highlight all that the Health and Human Service Department does because so much of what we do, it's not really obvious, but it's invaluable to the health and well being of our community. And we have great data to support that. Um, you know, as Anthony said, our full time health director, uh, health inspector, um, has been a, a huge asset for us. and. We have um, been able to invite several food establishments into our meetings um, and have public hearings to, to talk about the inspection, to talk about the recommendations, to talk about the next step. Uh, these have been constructive meetings um, and I, I feel like collaborative meetings. And you know, it's been a great opportunity, not only to improve the health and safety, but also to support our, our local businesses. Um, our environmental health specialist has been an incredible asset to the community. She's a fierce advocate for environmental safety and vocal in supporting residents' access to clean living conditions. Um, the assistant health director is continuously working on seeking grants and maintaining the ones we have. Um, as Anthony said, our drug-free community grant funds important events in the community like the Youth Action Team and special events like Parent University, School Diversion, uh, programs and coalition member training. Um, with the addition of our new part-time public health nurse, we've been able to take nursing support beyond just vaccine clinics to employee wellness, colorectal health awareness, blood pressure screenings, uh, and continued excellent monitoring of communicable diseases. Um, and our board, all three of us, uh, we're also active outside of our commitment uh, as an advisory role to the Health and Human Services Department. Laurel Goreville, who joins us tonight, is a liaison to the Wake Up. Um, and Elaine Silva leads our Nurses and Best Practices. Um, and I have been supporting our youth action team uh, to advocate for later school start times. And I'm also the medical consultant for the public schools. Um, so we're doing a lot. Um, we're busy and we're happy to be busy. And, you know, there's more work to be done. Um, I, I think we have a great foundation. And I think, you know, it's important that we continue to think about things like substance abuse. As Anthony mentioned, our substance abuse rates here in Wakefield are higher than our neighbors. Um, and we have our social so services coordinator who can help connect folks uh, with the services that can be helpful. Um, Anthony mentioned also that 55% of our residents that are eligible for SNAP don't have it. So, so we can help, you know, there's a lot we can do. These services exist. We have, we have the, the things we need to connect our neighbors and our community members with these services. Um, so, you know, I think with appropriate funding, we can continue and expand the valuable work that we do in the Health and Human Services Department. Thanks, thanks everyone. Very good, Candace. Thank you. Anybody else uh, comments, questions? Don? Sure. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, the the first is, I mean, I thought this was great. I think it's a, a remarkable array of services that is provided for less than 400,000. Um, I understand there are grants involved. And I'm just wondering if there is uh, some document or something that you have that sort of 
spells out the, the total expenditures, including the grants that are done, um, not just those that are paid out of the town budget. Yeah, so I don't I don't have one right now that specifies all of our grants together. Uh, we can definitely pull that together. Our major one is the Drug Free Communities Grant. That was the 10 year grant. Uh, I think I believe it's 125,000 a year. Um, so some of those programs we've already worked into uh, some other grants as well. Uh, we have smaller ones, all, you know, so I can pull together, you know, long story short, I can pull together a document that outlines all of our grant uh, grants together. We have small grants like Norris Wakefield that's only 12,000 a year. We have larger ones that, that we're writing for right now. Um, you know, if you get that to us, that would be great. That would be yeah. helpful. So my second question was, um, I, I was kind of surprised that the uh, highest level of utilization seemed to be the 25 to 40 year old cohort. Um, and I understand that the rest of the uh, groups were you know, only 10 year uh, increments, but um, is, um, is there anything uh, unusual about that? Or is that to be expected? I, I just find it interesting that it was the largest group of the uh, highest group of utilization of the services. Sure, yeah. So you're, I think you're referring to the social service slide, uh, social yeah. services coordinator slide, yeah. So um, I think for us, we were predicting we we're probably predicting a little bit more in the younger population as well, but I would say that, you know, that might be a byproduct of the schools doing a great job. They have a really good support for, they have a really good counseling program there as well. Uh, so a lot of families seek a lot of their support there. Um, I think the 25 to 40 group naturally would be one of our larger groups because we have, we already have a senior center that has a social service coordinator for 65 and over. Um, and our 25 to 40 group uh, is the other populate, I guess the only other natural population that our, our coordinator would be serving. Right. Okay, makes sense. Um, and my last question, and maybe this is more for Steve, but my understanding is that the SNAP eligibility or the SNAP benefits are changing as of uh, this month. And I'm wondering if there is a gap there that needs to be filled and if it's potentially something that can be done with ARPA funding. Um, some of the uh, 2.4, I think it's 2.4 million we have on spoken for at this point. I would, <coughs> I would say yes and yes. And we are working with the food pantry in discussions on that. Okay. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Stefan, you good? Your, your hand was up, you're all set? Yep, thank okay. you. Dennis. Uh, can we get a breakdown of the professional services? Yeah, is that uh, Kevin or Anthony? Uh, hey. um, I think what, what are you looking for for a breakdown? Yeah. Well, how does, what goes into it and how does it total? Can we just get a spreadsheet emailed out just so we can have it for the professional service? Oh, yeah, professional so the, services? Yeah, the 5316 account. Okay, um, I, I can tell you real quickly what that will include. That includes the um, salary for the director, Anthony, um, the chief public health nurse, and the senior health inspector. Uh, it also includes $200 for the constable uh, services, uh, specimen delivery to the state lab, $100, uh, the shop kiosk pickups uh, for needles, uh, $1,750, and the interface um, that I'm not sure if Anthony touched on that uh, was $10,000. But um, when the budget did go out, there should have been a tab on the bottom on the bottom budget that had that um it included so it, it was included in the budget it was just a separate tab okay it's a, on the bottom the allocation sheet is that what you're talking about yes that's correct okay and that's okay thank you very much yep 
All right, I don't see any other questions. Anthony and team, thank you for coming in tonight and uh, appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Steve, I'm inclined to go to John next. Uh, he's been very patient and quiet. If uh... It sounds good to me, Mr. Chairman. All right, John, are you there? Where'd you go? I am here. That's okay. It was, it was good listening to all that, actually. No problem. So um, I know we have a subcommittee. I don't know if the subcommittee met on this segment or not. Uh, they did not. Did not. We did not. Did not. They, were, they were sent out, and I think that the uh, uh, chairman felt they were pretty straightforward and didn't need to meet. We'll, maybe we'll meet and discuss them in more detail when we meet on the health insurance budget. Uh, who's going first, John or uh, Kevin? What's your pleasure? Uh, I'll do a quick overview, then turn it over to John if there's specific questions. Uh, <clears throat> first up is the general insurance. Uh, I think that this budget being $23,594 over the current fiscal year. Uh, this increase breaks down as follows. Uh, 21759 to the tax levy portion of the budget. $1,155 auto division, six, $680 to the sewer division. Uh, this budget covers the town buildings, motor vehicles, professional liability, and cybersecurity. Uh, the total budget request is $522,725, with $480,925 coming from the tax levy. 26,400 from other enterprise and 15,400 from the SOAR enterprise. With that, um, any specific questions for me? If not, I'll turn it over to John. Okay. Good. And okay. John, you had a, uh, a general insurance overview. Do you, do you want me to share that or? Yes, I would. Um, you know, this time of the year, this particular budget, you can't firm up um, pricing. Um, it's a little early. We don't usually start um, underwriting until, you know, sometime in April with applications and um, in mid-May, we, we get our pricing and then <laughs> Steve and I go to work and um, try to get it within um, what we what the request is. Um, property insurance, uh, property coverage continues to be uh, the biggest issue in, in the um, industry. 2022 was the second consecutive year of catastrophic losses or cat losses on over $100 billion. That disrupts the um, reinsurance market, which then affects the insurance rates, which bring it on down to us. This is a very heavy um, property uh, program that we have. We have $300 million in, in property coverage. I don't know if I see any problem. Um, we have a, I have a really good solid underwriter um, that we have that was assigned to me last year. Um, it, it is always a concern, um, and and cyber liability obviously is is the second largest concern in the industry right now. But you know the program is good, and um, you know I'm, I'm happy and comfortable with the request that we have. So, and I'll take any questions on anything with anything on the schedule or. Insurance in general. Very good. Uh, Ed. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, John. Um, law enforcement liability, I haven't seen that in the past. Is that is that a new type of coverage or what is that kind of bad acts of uh, police officers? No, we've actually had it for years, but we had it tucked into the general liability policy. Mm -hmm. um, but it is separate because it covers... Um, you know, um, excess of force, uh, which we have a few claims going with that. Yeah. Um, so I just broke it out to show that we do have it, it. It is a it's in the general liability, but it's a separate section of it. I just want to show that we do have it, but it is a separate uh, policy within the general liability. OK, thank you. That's interesting. Okay. So, fun. Um, so I also did notice that uh, law enforcement liability was listed there. Um, is there any um, a separate line item um, broken out for uh, fire uh, liability? 
and is included under the uh, commercial general liability policy. So under law enforcement, they, you know, they perform duties that's outside of bodily injury and property damage, whether it's on premises or, um, you know, something that happens out of park and forestry or water and sewer. Um, in, in the case of uh, the fire department, sometimes they use well, excessive force to get into a building, but we pick up that un under the commercial general liability policy, <coughs> bodily injury and property damage. Law enforcement liability is different because they're using, <clears throat> you know, excess force and, and you know, things that would come into um, you know, discrimination type uh, claims. And, and so it, it kind of, it has a separate form. So, it, we had it included under the general liability policy, even though it had a separate section in there. I just separated it to show you that we, you know, we do have law enforcement. Liability. We always have had law enforcement liability. It's not a new coverage for us. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, John, I was just curious on the uh, errors and omissions, public entity entity errors and omissions. Just a yes. little explanation of that. <clears throat> So we have it actually um, under both educators' liability, legal liability, and public. We call public officials E and O. So whether it's finance committee or town councilors or uh, um, appeal board, or any of those, they make decisions every day, right? A lot of them do. And when someone gets financially hurt from that de um, decision, it's not a bodily injury, it's not a property damage, but you make a decision, you know, um, and someone um, gets harmed in that decision, you know, they can bring a claim against the town because you made, um, you didn't do your, your job, you know, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, the duties, you know, didn't carry them out. Um, so it's not, it's not a bodily injury. But it's just um, finance committee has the same thing. You know, someone brought a claim against the finance committee that you're not doing your job diligently. Um, you either made a decision you shouldn't have made, um, or should have made a decision you didn't make, and it harmed somebody um, financially. Then they would bring a claim against you. So, I hope that answers the question. Okay. No, I, I think so. Thanks, Stefan. You up again? Um, yeah, I wanted to make one uh, just uh, comments about this uh, table. It's it's great that we have here uh, listed our uh, deductibles, uh, limits of liability. But I guess to the right of this, it's, it would be great if there was a separate column added to this uh, to show the breakdown in each of these particular categories, how that five hundred and twenty um, some odd thousand dollars uh, breaks down to each one of these particular categories. I assume some uh, coverages are relatively expensive compared to others. Um, just a general insight into that would be uh, would be helpful. Like on the law enforcement liability, that's twenty one thousand dollars. Not that I'm not going to give you a breakdown of it now, but you're right. I, I could do that. There was a time when our property policy was just another policy in our, our schedule of policies, but now it represents almost forty percent of our premium. So, you know, we, we definitely could do that. It would be on the existing one, but not on the projected one, because I have no idea what it's going to look like in, in July. But I, I, we can do that next year. Or this year. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. John, thanks. I'm sure we'll see you again in a week or two, I guess. No, you're going to see me right now. <laughs> it's not done. Good. Go ahead. What's next? That'll be workers call, oh, uh, Kevin. Workers comp. I'll do a quick overview on workers comp and then turn it over to John. Uh, workers comp, we're recommending the fiscal 24, 24 budget be increased $5,220 over the current fiscal year. This increase breaks down. The tax levy portion of the budget is actually seeing a decrease of $2,500. The water division is seeing a decrease of $859. The sewer division is seeing an increase of $1,752. And the municipal light department is seeing an increase of $6,827. For, uh, the total budget request is $493,000, with $434,000 coming from the tax levy, $7,400 coming from the water enterprise, $10,600 from the sewer enterprise, and 41,000 from the gas and light department. 
And with that, I'll turn it over to John. So, um, the, you know, this budget is really based on three components. You know, what our experience rating is, what our payrolls are, and what are the rates that are being um, published by the uh, Workers' Compensation Rating Bureau and then approved by the um, Division of Insurance. So our experience um, modification is uh, 0.98, which is the first time I can remember it in at least 20 years. So that's very favorable. We were really helped by the, um, the year um, when we had COVID and had the shutdown of on-premises expo uh, exposures. But we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of the uh, off-premises exposures were working because the weather was so good. So we had a year, um, we'll take that down. To, um, I don't need that up there. Okay, thanks. You don't need it, is that what you said? John? I don't need that up there. No, I don't need that up there. Yeah. Okay. So um, we were, uh, it, it was it was a really you know, good year for us. Um, so we had about 80,000 80, in claims. We're gonna lose that year. And we have to replace it with what's going on this year. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Payrolls have been increased by 4.5 um, percent, and you know it, the payrolls are getting close to 2.4 million dollars every single year. Now four percent, we're getting close to 60 million dollars in payroll here. So payroll actually uh, works as a positive for us because in, in the payroll, it has um, we have what's called expected losses. The state says that if, let's just take an expected loss of a dollar for one of our classes, they would say that 55 cents of that should be assigned for losses based on your payroll. So when our payroll goes up, our expected losses go up with it. And if we can trend evenly with our losses, we can stay in and around 1%. 0.98 to us is tremendous. So five years ago, we were at 132. We're at 32% higher than the state. And that 32% represented over $150,000 in, in, in premium. So um, we're in a really good spot with our experience model. I'd really like to stay there. Due to the favorable experience, um, the company allows you credits. And that's something we, we've always strived for. And last year, they gave us a 3% credit um, on top of the uh, 1.00 we had last year. That 3% is $14,000. So it's significant. Um, in this budget. Last year, um, right before the renewal on 7-1, we received finally the dividend that they had promised. Um, I've been working with the Division of Insurance uh, for a width of $9,500. Um, they haven't, it, it's gonna be four dividends for us. We're definitely gonna get them. And when I talked to them, they, they didn't have them calculated yet. But we kind of just discussed it and said, well, nine thousand dollars is probably a good number to throw in there. Normally, you'd wait for the dividend in hand, but it was too significant not to put in here. Uh, nine thousand dollars is like one and a half percent, so I, I did put that in there. I did send out the experience worksheets, and um, as I was saying earlier, and I'll just read these for um, and how this works. The three years that our experience rating right now. We had a um, eighty thousand um, dollar losses in one year. That was a, again going back to the COVID. The next year was one hundred ninety three, and last year was three hundred thirty. The three thirty was actually a little bit high for us. We we still have six open claims there. We're going to lose that eighty. So as we get out of the COVID, we start to normalize our operations. We're going to start to normalize our loss experience. However. This year, to date, as of what is today, as of Monday, we had about we have one hundred thirty thousand dollars in losses. One of those losses, which is, is very rare for us to have an auto accident, but we did. We had an employee that was hit in a car down in Greenwood that was kind of t-boned. He was t-boned, and um, he's still collecting workers' comp from us. But we put the auto carrier on, on notice, so when that claim is closed, it's about thirty thousand. We're actually at about $100,000 right now. So that 80 that's we're dropping off, we're at 100. You know, we could see ourselves in this position again next year, which is good. You know, uh, this is a, you don't want the volatility of the experience uh, modification to take this back up to $600,000 where it was a few years ago. So 
confusing maybe. So I'll break down anything I just said. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Completely understandable, I guess, John. Either that or totally confusing. <laughs> Um, I just have to say, uh, Dennis and Dan, it was good to see you again. Billy B, where are you? I see you down there. Hi, John. Hi, to you again, John. Yeah, so as far as the numbers go, John, I, again, my observation, it was helpful the way you described it. You know, the COVID year was very low, so that's fallen off, so that's changed the math. You get some, you know, depending upon how that how it shakes out this year. Um, but so far, so good, or at least in a relative term. Well, we only had 23 claims last year. We only have 14 to date right now. So we're right on in that 20 again. And two of those claims, uh, one of, two of those claims, one of the claims was, was denied. Okay. And the other one, uh, the other two went to uh, DIA hearings and, and we lost on both of those division of industrial accident hearings. So I just think that it comes down to um, our on premises is, is much more um, secure. I think we have better technology now, uh, people more conscientious, they want to work, they want to put money into their 401ks, um, they're healthier, they think healthier. Um, I, I think all that goes into, um, I, I think we're in a really good trend here. Problem is that when people do get hurt, especially the older ones where the body's a little bit more compromised, it costs a little bit more. And when I see a, like a rotator cuff come in and I, in the surgery, you can just write in eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. So it doesn't take much for us to get up to two or $300,000, just a few claims. So, but that's what it's for. So, but right now we're in a good trend and I, I, I really, it, it's very enjoyable to work on it and even enjoy it. It's very enjoyable to come here and have, um, you know, a small request. So. Thank you, John. See you, Dan. All right, guys. Uh, thank you. John, is that it? Was that the pieces? Yep. Um, nope. I don't know. I think I'm all done. Sure. Okay. You guys have a good night. Thanks, John. Enjoy have your time. Bill. Appreciate it, John. See you, Bill. <clears throat> all right. Um, you and and uh, Kevin covering the rest, I would assume. Yes, maybe we have Kevin, Kevin can do retirement yeah. next. So yeah, retirement. Uh, we have Kathy Cheek. Um, I'm with us tonight, Kathy, the executive director of the field retirement system. Um, the fiscal 24 retirement budget increased $402,223 over the current fiscal year. This breaks down the increase in the contributory tax levy portion of the budget. The increase was $359,026. The non contrib tax levy portion actually decreased. $37,590. The water, sewer, and light department transfers increased the total of $80,767. Uh, this budget is based on an updated fund schedule voted by the Wayfield Family Board that runs to 26 and is based on a 20, January 2022 uh, valuation. The current funding schedule is 73.7% using an investment return of 7.4%. The total request for fiscal 24 is $7,836,037 with $6,409,235 coming from the tax levy and $1,436,802 coming from the enterprise transfers. With that, if there are any specific questions, I do want to point out on page eight of the budget, uh, Dan did point out a uh, correction for fiscal 2022, the actual uh, net return. It says 11.29%. That should be a, a negative 11.29%. Okay. Um, Dan, sorry, I didn't have that up while Kevin was talking, but. <clears throat> um questions uh and any other comments uh on the budget so far kathy you'll be available for questions then right you don't have anything else to add yes no very good ed uh yes what is the uh transfer from linfield i said i noted that that uh, is that um, was... go ahead kevin 
Okay. Uh, no, go ahead, Kathy. You, you can you can mention that. Yeah, that is one of our um, retirees who worked for both Wakefield and Linfield. So a portion of his retirement gets charged back to Linfield. Okay. Thank you. Was there any other questions or comments on this information that was provided? So that, that's, of... that, that's unique. That's I assume that's Jack Roberto, the building inspector. Yes. So at this point, because we have a lot more other positions in the town or have dollars allocated from other communities. So some point down the road, there could be more situations like that, right? Yes, exactly. Thank you. The overall increase, uh, Kevin, uh, you might have mentioned it. I was looking for it. What was the overall increases, would you say? Uh, the, the overall increase to the tax levy was the 5.28%. Um, overall, it was the 5.4%. Um, right. And, and what is that? What, what accounts for that? I'm sorry. I guess that's what I meant. Just. Uh, Change in expenses. Hey, no, Kevin, just you. Know, Kevin, you want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, so um, we had a valuation done, um, and the previous uh, valuation that was done in 2020, we actually had increases about seven and a half to eight uh, percent per year, and the amortization of the unfunded liability. 2021 calendar year and 20 were both excellent years. So when the valuation was done, we were able to uh, keep the same time frame for the amortization of the unfunded, but we were able to lower the rate of increase from year to year uh, on the payments from, I think it was like seven and a half percent down to the 5% um, that we're at now. So. Uh, we had a lot of good news. Um, otherwise, under the old schedule from January 1st of 20, we'd be looking at more like a seven and a half percent increase, uh, not five and a quarter. And and we're not going to talk about 2022's uh, performance. Sorry, you just cut out after 2022, Dan. I'm sorry. What'd you say? I said 2022's performance, um, as you noted, was a negative 11.29%. Uh, so timing was really important in that we're not doing evaluation as of January 1st of 23, um, because the uh, obviously we expect 7.4% increase in our assets and we got a negative 11. Uh, so now is not the time to do evaluation. We're just going to be crossing our fingers that the market recovers um, during 23 before the 1124 evaluation is, is uh, done. We do these valuations every other year. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank Kathy, you. Thank you. All right. Um, anyone else on Steve that we want to uh, cover? No, I think you can go to uh, Animal Inspector and then Parking. Yep. All right. That'd be Kevin. Yep. Uh, the Animal Inspector's budget uh, recommending that this budget be level funded. Uh, main expenses within this budget under contractual services, the uh, professional services line item, $37,500. And this is for contracted animal control duties. It also includes services as needed. Um, the sundry charges line item, $1,500. That's for the dog pound fees that we paid to Sargis. The total budget request is $48,600. Okay. 
Questions on this one? Very good. Parking it is. Uh, last budget is the parking clerk budget. Recommending that this budget be decreased $209 over the current fiscal year. Uh, Kenny State, the former animal control officer, handles the responsibilities for this department. Um, he works six hours a week, and Mike Nassel is the part time hearing officer. Uh, personal services has increased $341 to the salary increase. Uh, contractual services has been decreased $500. Uh, we zeroed out the printing and binding line item. This was used to print tickets. The tickets are now printed on the handheld devices um, that we bought. Um, we reduced materials and supplies fifty dollars, which was based on both the prior year trends. The total budget request for fiscal. I guess I'll jump in. Did we lose Kevin? Yeah, he said total budget uh, for the year was the uh, $12,573. This is also, a, 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 I guess, a revenue account, um, you know, where we, the parking tickets, uh, you know, come in per year. Um, usually that runs around 40000 a year between the uh, parking violations that we collect and that go to the registry of deeds, a registry of motor vehicles, I should say. Um, and this year, through half the year, we're about uh, uh, 21, 22,000 in, in parking revenue. Great. Um, question, Doug Butler. Psyched I got here in time for parking. So uh, am I. <laughs> Yeah, you were hoping, Steve. <laughs> $42,000 annually. I mean, before we had the parking clerk, we were pulling in like 25 or 30, doing nothing. So why on earth do we still have, why do we have the position? Why do we, have, like, because by the way, it's not just this money, it's the money in the cops budget too, right? Yeah, this, these are the hearings, these handle the- uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so more thing. importantly, I'll, I'll tell you, it keeps, it, 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 it keeps all the hearings away from me. And <laughs> the, like, it's ridiculous that we, the amount of money we spent at this, we were promised like a hundred and I think, I think Ed was offering up like $115,000 a year is what we were going to collect. It, I mean, uh, Ed, Ed, I Dombrows Ed Dombrowski, that would be, a that would be Ed was the one who, Ed was the champion of it. I mean, they all said yes, but Ed was the champion of it. It's just, I, I will tell you that it is a bad it, position. It, it, it's a very cheap and very necessary feature uh, for people to come in and appeal their parking tickets, people that uh, uh, ignored their parking tickets and need help so they can register their cars or get their new driver's licenses. And we work through this with uh, the company in New York that manages all of this, and we have to buy track it. So it's um, not a lot of money for a lot of service. Oh my God, we threw away so much money on this, Steve. And you're saying to me that it is- 12,000 a year, 12,000 yeah, a year. All the money you've spent on the stuff for the parking, on the guys to hire. Okay, you're that's a different, that's that's a different budget. Cash flow thing. These, are the, the, these, these, these were people that were here from before. And um, all right, uh, we're gonna agree to disagree. It isn't, no, it isn't an agree to disagree. I think next year you've got to justify keeping this parking person on. But the, these aren't the people kidding. writing tickets, correct? No, these aren't the people writing tickets. These are the, uh, the uh, people handling the payments that come in, handling the appeals. Oh handling. good, I get to have this fight again when the police budget? That's where yes. you should have. The, the people handling the tickets are the police in the police budget. Right. So, you know, and you gave it to them. Don't run away from it. You guys gave this to them and it was a crappy thing to do. What? The tickets? We used to collect 25 grand before we had anybody, but when we had just random cops writing the tickets and then we added a body and now have probably upgraded the body. And it's just, you know, 
And granted, and by the way, it's not like it's improved parking downtown. <laughs> the signs have helped. All right. Anything else on parking? I'm glad Doug showed up. I know. Uh, we're going to have to move the meetings to eight <laughs> so Doug, Doug can make it earlier on hockey nights. <laughs> um, Tonight was drama night at the Galvin. I didn't see you all there. So I'm like, you know, suitably disappointed. You, you brought drama here, Doug. It's okay. <laughs> uh, you, you, you'd miss me if I was gone, Steve. I, I absolutely would. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, Doug. Um, I think that's all the budgets. Is that right? Uh, mercifully so, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, on committee comments, I, I did talk to Dan a little bit, and I think Dan has is the forecasting model that I can share or he can share if we want to touch on that first. Um, is that all right with you, Dan? Yeah, I've made a number of changes to it given new information like tonight. Sure. So um, I will share my screen. Can everybody see that? I don't know why I can't see the screens that are shared. What did I do wrong? I usually can, but go ahead. Don't wait for me. Looks like everybody else can. All yeah, right. I can see it. Okay. So um, given the latest information, um, I'm going to start out with a question to, back to Jim regarding your conversation this morning on the schools. Um, is the rumor of 5.22% Tax levy or total? <clears throat> um, that would be tax levy, I believe. Okay. So I went ahead and put in the 5.22% for the schools. I also put in um, a guesstimate for the fire and police contracts. So I added 2% to the personal services budget that Kevin had. Just to put in a placeholder. I had discussions with Steve regarding uh, state um, aid and so forth. So the way things stand now, I'm going to scroll up to we are approximately two million dollars in the hole between revenue and uh, expense, um, and I'm using eight point five million dollars for local receipts. And I think Steve, you're about uh, 7.3 or 7.4 million, something like that. Correct. Um, yeah. So if I put in for uh, this two dollar uh, deficit, it turns into more like three million. Um, Kevin owes me a lot of dinners. Um, so I think we're about two million in the hole, and you can see that this is going to run out for the rest of the time uh, into the future. And based on those numbers on our free cash, we will run out of free cash during fiscal year 26. So if the schools are granted a 5.22% increase, um, we are in a world of hurt. We're gonna have to be cutting um, every place else out of these budgets. Um, I don't have DPW, of course, yet. I think it's another big one. Um, health insurance is another big one that uh, we'll find out those numbers pretty soon. But I've got an assumption for both of those in the three, uh, three and a half or four percent range. Right. So it just uh, Dan mentioned the schools. So um, the subcommittee, which which I'm on, and, and Doug Butler. Chairs, we, we did go to the school subcommittee meeting this morning and uh, the preliminary budget book is out and it's in the 5.22 range, which includes some undisclosed amount for uh, Kohler, assuming they settle a contract in some fashion. So uh, those are sorts, sort of the pieces of the puzzle that uh, the school, I think a general shared uh, about that. So uh, just to give context to what Dan mentioned. So I don't know what that is, plus minus, but that was that was the number they were working with. Uh, right. I, I should also mention when uh, Kevin gave me the $200,000 for an article for fire overtime for fiscal year 23, 
um, I included that um, spend in this um, forecast as well. Dan, will you send me that so I can, you know, tomorrow, will you send me it? Oh yeah, I'll, after this meeting, I'll send it out. Thank you. So um, what Dan is describing obviously is the, uh, to cover the uh, proposed expenses to date, it was about 2 million of free cash. Correct, Dan? Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, you can see you can see the um I can go back up here. Yep. So here's here's our deficits based on our, so it's roughly two million dollars for this year, 1.6 next year, 2.4, 2.6, and so forth. And I should also mention that for the school budget, I have the 5.22 for 24, and then I have four percent thereafter. All right, Ed, you, you had a question, comment? You, you're, you're muted. Sorry, Ed, couldn't hear you. He's muted. I'm sorry about that. Um, so Jim, I was just curious, uh, we're still in negotiations with the teachers, but they've put as, as you say, an undisclosed um, contingency in the budget. That was how I understood it. And Doug can jump in, Doug Butler was on and, uh, and uh, Brian, Brian was on also this morning, but yes. Yeah, my, own, my, my comment would be, um, I hope you can settle for 2% in some of the other unions, but I'm not optimistic on that. So your, your escalator, it, you know, I would go higher than two. That's just my personal opinion. Which escalator? What in, did in, you in mean by that? Services. I, I think you mentioned you were, you were escalating the, the, the police budget by 2%. I just, I just. Uh, oh, the, oh, oh, police. Please. Yeah, yeah so, I, I just think in general, uh, you know, with inflation and whatnot, I think it'd be hard to settle for two. Yeah, so for police and fire, I'm adding 2% on to what they've already got. So they're, each of those budgets, police and fire, would be uh, four, four and a quarter, I think, in total is what I've got, mm -hmm. something like that. Actually, I, I do have that right here. Let me, let me pull it up. So... It. I had it. It's okay. So 4.2 for uh, fire. And let's see. I include it. I got to do multiply 1.02. Yeah, so 4.3 for police. So that's mm -hmm. that would be the t overall um, if it is a 2%. So anything above that's going to increase that, obviously. To something over 4.3 percent yeah right steve um have you been successful in keeping negotiations here in town and not uh, ended up at the jlmc with police and fire so far good let's hope so yeah that's my goal yeah yeah, and again, so police, fire, and and the school uh, teachers are still within the they're still negotiating all three functions, all three groups. So, Dan uh, took the five point two two that I provided, and he put those escalators in. They just spoke about just to have some numbers for dialogue. It's it's not finished. It's not completely accurate, right? Right, but the other right. problem is, is the five point two two is more than five in person, more than five point two two in personal services and negatives on like other stuff, which, you know, is unfortunate, but is what it is, is what they have in there. Uh, I mean, I think the all of them run the risk of having big. The big problem is, is and we talked about this this morning, is I, I guess we as a committee probably need to be tired of the two and a half percent headline rate for the contractual increase that turns into four and four and a half with steps and all the other non yeah. stuff that goes into it. Right. So that's three. that's our. It's three, Doug. Remember <laughs> what? It's been three. It's been one and a half, one and a half every year. One and a half, one and a half. Right. But but magically that turns into 4.2 when you Yeah, it does. Yep. Yeah. I know it's magic. It's amazing. It's the new magic. It's not magic. It's just, you know, when the when the baseline's that high, we, we start running into these problems. 
Right. Dan's been Dan's been squawking for a long time. I'm sorry to cut you. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, uh, Doug. But but yeah, I, I you know. I'm the, the, other thing, too. <laughs> the other thing I should mention is on the new growth. Uh, we've only, I mean, I, I ran with uh, Steve's thoughts is roughly 1.7 million for new growth. And because we really haven't been able to get solid numbers on the power line. Right. And, uh, you know, so the schools have a 12 step, uh, 12 steps uh, for, for the uh, teachers. So, you know, the, the annual raises within the steps are, are in the 7% range. Yeah. So annual increases for the schools for each step is around 7%. And, and so you have a lane. And then if you move from a lane, then you're going up higher for that particular year. Okay. And when you top out, then you're just doing the COLA. Uh, no different than police and fire. And I believe Steve sort of, and I chatted about that. They don't have 12 steps, but they have X number of steps, Steve, correct? In, in the titles, in the functions, like three or four or something. Four, four steps. So police and fire have four steps, and and then so they have bigger raises while they're jumping step to step, and then then they they have the cola. So hold um, on, they have four. Uh, wait a second, they have only four steps. Correct. In police and fire, right? But they become not a lieutenant become, one, lieutenant two. There's not like all right. The, well, there's firefighter one, firefighter two, then there's lieutenant one, lieutenant two. Captain one, captain two, captain three, captain four. So oh, yes. Okay. So that sounds like eight or nine steps to me. Well, <laughs> no, because it's a it's a promotion. Yeah, you have to pass. If if you're a if you're a teacher with a master's, you go right from one to twelve if you stay with us. Where in the police of fire, you have to pass uh, civil service exams to to advance uh, certain titles. Right. But anyway, my point was on that. Yeah, my point was that the. Uh, step increases with the Kohler increases are seven percent in the schools approximately now uh, they went on to say also that uh most towns you're seeing 12 to 14 percent across three years for cola purposes so say four percent a year for three years on the uh on the low side for cola with Mass Teachers Association, with what's been going on in some of the other communities that have either struck or almost struck or whatever they've done. I think, Doug, right? Is that what we heard? I do. So if the teachers and police are on strike at the same time, how do we handle, how do, who handles the picket lines? <laughs> the parking clerks. The parking people. Parking, handle. parking clerks. Christ, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Stefan, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned this in one of our prior meetings. I think it was before the uh, before the holidays. Um, but you know, we, we were talking about uh, all the union contracts that were coming up, and 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 I feel like I I did had met I had mentioned this given the inflationary environment that the the prior predictions that we had in here for like four percent it just it's unreasonable. Um, and um, and I I don't think that any of us here on the finance committee should be surprised at this at this total you know even if it's uh listed here at a a net uh 5.2 percent um you had mentioned that uh, you were seeing seven percent possibly even more with step in line increases step in line increases <clears throat> uh, one thing i wanted to mention about this is uh the forecast is um i guess re regarding capital um, this this one particular item that he actually has uh, highlighted here. Um, are we uh, could we be in a situation where we uh, need to defer capital? Uh, are yes. we able to do that? Yeah. So if, if you've seen um, some of my presentations in the past, um, roughly twenty years ago, uh, we had to cut back on capital down to three hundred thousand, three hundred four hundred thousand dollars because we didn't have the money. And capital has had back then had become, you know, that line item that got whacked when other line items were taking too much revenue. Um, it, and I, I think that's really, really unfortunate um, because if you start ignoring capital, it starts costing a whole lot more down the road. And so I would hope that, that what, if these numbers hold up, if we are $2 million in a hole, Okay, maybe capital could take you know a, maybe a million dollar hit, 
but other budgets have got to take um, another million or more hit as well, um, or we just can't do it. And for those that have been on the finance finance committee for, for a long time, may recall those days when the school department came in with a, a budget that we could not afford. Um, I happened to be the chairman at that, uh, during the, the sessions of the finance committee, uh, cut the school budget by a million dollars, but it, based on their ask. And, you know, town meeting went along with it because we presented the numbers and we convinced them that we just don't have the money. And school department had to figure out a way to cut their million dollars and surprise, surprise, they did. Unfortunately, where they did cut the most was things like IT. Um, all the school crossing guards disappeared for the most part in some other areas. But when they did cut, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't teachers and salaries so much. It was things like IT and janitorial services and stuff like that. But that's, yeah, I say that's 20 years ago. Right. Um, Dad, did you have another comment? Yeah, I have two comments. One is uh, on the personal services with schools. I, you know, school departments hide a lot of new folks using ESSER money. And then eventually the ESSER money goes away and then they put the, on the school budget. So I don't know to what impact that is um, in the school department here. Commenting on the teacher's step scale. One one uh, thing I see, I've seen in the past with school departments is, all right, so you've got a teacher at, let's say, step 12. Teacher retires or leaves. They hire a teacher, replacement teacher at step four. The variance in that salary money is leg money. Instead of conserving that money, the school departments spend the money. So that's something I always like to take a look at with school departments. I don't know how much money they turned back, Kevin, at the end of the last fiscal year, but oh, uh, they like to spend every penny. Yeah, they encumbered most of uh, over a million dollars of what they had left over to uh, to put in other places. I forget what they returned, but yeah. the other comment you made, they, I believe they're relatively above board on the FTEs and where they're going and how they're going to be funded. Um, and then when they are retiring, they are not using that money. They're backing it out and putting it back down. The, the, the write-up the write up does explain that stuff, Ed, which are great points. Um, okay, that's that's good to hear. That's really yeah. Good. Then I don't. I wouldn't say they're dragging that along, um, but I'm not. That's about as far as I'm going to defend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so again, I, I I know we're all chomping at the bit around the the teacher, the education budget, and whatnot. But frankly, like the one that's seen the explosion in population in terms of people has been in terms of employees has been sort of fire and police, um, and that you know that's because we've gotten a bunch of grants for it over the years. And frankly, like maybe you know if those grants have run out, maybe it's time. If that's a place where we have to find room. Yeah, again, I think the point to this is uh, in in deep, uh, Dan and I talked about it briefly. Is if the budgets all come in like they are, and and I mentioned it this morning to the schools, you know, so they they sort of toe the line with everything else and level fund it. And well, you can't level fund electricity forever, right? At a twenty five percent increase, or you know, so there's an effort made to level fund things that ultimately are just sort of kicking the can down the road as well. So. Uh, Without additional revenue, without additional revenue or less expenses, you know the 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 end is near uh, for this for these for this uh, you know this deficit to be covered. So, uh, and that's across the whole spectrum, not just schools, obviously. Uh, but you know, um, Stefan, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, there, there, Doug had mentioned um, uh, fire. Uh, I know. We reviewed fire just earlier tonight, um, and there was um, there was quite a substantial amount of overtime associated with uh, the fire department. And um, what was included in the budget this year was a five-year average of the um, of of the previous year's overtime expenditures, and it, I believe it amounted to six hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that was right, right um, around there. So that's about, in terms of number of firefighters, I think it's about um, a head count of about seven or eight. Um, and I was just curious, how many, uh, 
active job requisitions do we have out there now for for firefighters for the town of Lakeville? I think Chief said he had two people in the academy, and and then it'd be fully staffed, right, uh, Steve? Do you know? Correct. 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 Yeah. Fifty-five total with with the two guys at the academy. Okay, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say though is is that uh, you know we've been spending you know, on average in the past five years, about seven FTE uh, of overtime. However, we only have, you know, two people, you know, I guess in the in the pipeline uh, to replace, you know, anyone who may be retiring, but uh, it's definitely not going to fill the, fill the gap. And I think what's happening is, is that we should expect to see in the future the same five-year average of about $650,000 in overtime charges for the fire department in, in, in the future. Um, and that's unless we, you know, hire a significant number of people, at least seven FTE. Um, and then the other point that I wanted to bring up too is, is that uh, uh, in those years where we were lead, uh, where we had to make some I guess uh, some cuts in capital was overtime in particular areas uh, like police and fire. Uh, did, were those taken a look at as well? Uh, yeah, I think not so much, but fire for my entire time on the finance committee, fire overtime has always been large. And every time we complain about it and trying to figure out some way to reduce it, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, we, 48 or 49 full-time in the department, 55 and our overtime budget hasn't gone down. So it's a problem with. And you just cut out after the word problem, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's, it's the, because we've hired a bunch of firefighters and, and, and that number has not come down and it becomes a question of, you know, oh, if we were paying 650,000 with 48 firefighters, maybe we should go back to 48. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. I think basically in cold friends tonight. Dennis? COVID and everything else affects the numbers. So let's, let's call it, they have more people out sick and hurt with retirement and military leave than they do for just general vacation makeup. Uh, the, the, the Stone M fire, he says, fine, they sent an engine over there last week, but they had to bring in another crew while that crew was over at, at Stoneham for a minimum of four hours. And they're just sitting on a backup engine because the other engine too is, is over in Stoneham. Fine, but that's part of the contract negotiations. If that, we're still at minimum manning, but minimum manning, when we send somebody out, doesn't count those three guys that left. Now you have to supplement them. That's a problem with the minimum manning criteria. There are employees, they, they're on staff. Why can't they be counted? We get mutual aid to back cover us if something happens. I don't understand why we have to backfill. I don't understand that when we go out in mutual aid. That, that, that bothers me. That's, that's just a question. Okay. Right. All right. So I, I, I guess uh, what Dan wanted to bring out and, and I was asking about it was basically how things could shake out with these numbers. And uh, this is what we're looking at. And the question really is going to become when we go to vote on these towards the, you know, in another in another month or so, um, how the numbers look and how comfortable we are bringing it forward to the uh, to the body at town meeting. So, uh, the two million, you know, sometimes there's money returned to the general fund across uh, all budgets. You know, is that eight hundred? Is it six hundred? Is it one point two? Is it nothing? It, it's those are all pieces of the final puzzle each year. So um, 
I was very concerned about it. I, I was a little less concerned about it, but it's perfectly clear as described by all of you that it's something we need to be concerned about and we've got to see how it plays out. And, you know, when we run out of money, quote unquote, you know, we need, we need advanced planning and advanced warning of that. Right. It's yeah, it's there, man. It's there. We're going to have to cut. Right. Okay. Right. Unless we get a bonanza with the light, the light project coming come, coming forward right away, and and it's state state aid. We also have a chance on state aid. We only have House One. We Senate. We still you know so the state aid is not a final number. It's you know thirteen one, but that could go up. Right. We certainly in line doing the spending and we're looking to see the uh, receipts to help offset it, right? Right, and can we still use APA money to close the gap too if we have to? That is a possibility, yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we, and I think every, every union is aware of that too, so. Yeah, a lot of, uh, there's a number of communities that have used APA money to pay bonuses. To employees, I've been asked and have said no. <laughs> that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's um, all I got. Yeah. Okay. Except for the parking clerks. Any other? I get just a couple of other items. Any other comments from the committee members? <laughs> all right. So uh, next meeting is the the sixteenth. And the schools will be coming in for a preliminary uh, review of the budget. Oh, I we, can't wait. <laughs> we ask them to come in uh, twice, uh, once, and then they'll be back in at the end of the month with a presumably uh, final budget approved by their uh, their school committee uh, board. The uh, the early numbers, I, I went over that. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the special education on a district expense was down by approximately 330,000 looking into next year. So uh, that was great. And it's still part of the 5.22. So uh, this, the school budget, we were, uh, we were given some early information. I think Doug, that this, you know, the special ed could be substantial and it, and it was a negative. So anyway, uh, next meeting we have DPW and articles. As far as articles go, Steve, uh, do we have anything for uh, uh, sped stabilization? Is, is that, uh, are there any of those articles, uh, that, that, will they be looked at or talked about in that uh, realm? <laughs> I have not seen a request to put more, any more money into sped stabilization uh, this year. I would probably um, speak against it uh, where I think, and if Kevin's still on, um, I think of the 1.9 or so million um, encumbered in this fiscal year from last fiscal year on the school department, wasn't a lot of it supposedly for special ed placements and tuitions. Prepaying tuitions. Prepaying tuitions. Over a million. Over right. a million dollars. Yeah. yeah. So I would see it unlikely that there'd be any reason to look at. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. I, I was thinking about it after the meeting today. I had written it down to ask. So um, I haven't heard a request on it. Um, that would come from the schools, schools, right? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully they'll be, uh, we'll have the um, refuse article, which is usually the biggest one. Um, uh, uh, you know, the other ones are the, are the normal ones. Uh, Kevin mentioned a supplement out of free cash. Um, yep. Uh, you know, the uh, debt service one should be pretty much what we've been looking at. Um, I think there may be something for Medicaid or Medicare, but not a huge number, Kevin. Correct. Maybe yeah. 10, 15,000. Yeah. I don't think there's... Uh, okay. Yeah. I don't think there's any big asks this, this year for whatever. Okay. Any other committee comments? All right, thank you. Entertain a motion to adjourn for this evening. So moved. Second. second. Everybody's second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for the dialogue and attendance. Talk soon. Thank, thank you. you.
All right, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, feel better, Steve. Thank you.